And this is Weapon Weaponized. So when we, when we started the interview, something that, that Jay said kind of right away that was so interesting to me was that OSAP, it, from the very onset, was technological. It was technology. It was about discovery of disruptive technologies. And you, and you look at all the DIRDs and the reports, and obviously they're thinking forward-looking 30, 50 years from now, what could be a disruptive technology, no matter where it's from? What, what could be a disruptive technology? And then he said, but look, um, where the evidence led is that there were, there were other things that we learned. There was a disruptive technology aim, but that there were a lot of other things they learned when they were studying things like the ranch. So, so that really threw me for a loop that, um, you know, something like OSAP came in with the idea of identifying future threats and then realized, wow, there's a lot more going on. He talked about that in his interview with us. So everybody's phone is off? That's just as far as ringer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mine's uh, off. And alarms are off? The cameras are all in this good one's little AV common marker. Okay. <clears throat> Jay, have you done an on-camera interview before? Have you done interviews before? So this is the first. I mean, your world is the black world, mm -hmm. classified stuff. Right. Can you give me broad strokes of your career, the highlights, and a kind of secure program that you worked on? Sure. Uh, you know, I started uh, military. I was a full-time reservist uh, with the Air Force, and then I moved up to Maryland to work at Pax River uh, to do weapons integration with the F-18 uh, flight test uh, out of Nav Air. Uh, and from there, I went to the Office of Naval Intelligence, uh, where I was recruited to be an aerospace engineer working with them uh, to look at, you know, really apply the, the blue knowledge, as we call it, uh, and apply it to the red and, and potential adversaries and write up reports on what I think foreign capabilities can do or not do. Right? In a sense, reverse engineering. Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. Uh, and you take that uh, into to DIA, uh, went over to the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, to work in the Defense Warning Office, uh, where I was applying the same knowledge, but at a higher level, uh, and more kind of orchestrating the intel community at that point. There's a term we use, validation. Whereas uh, if you're building an F-22 or you're building a Joint Strike Fighter, uh, you, you know, you're really kind of designing that to counter a potential threat, and that potential threat needs to be a validated threat, because uh, what we can't have happen is uh, a Lockheed Martin or a Boeing, you know, spending tons of, of money against a threat that they, they say exists, where the government needs to say it exists. So it's kind of a contractual thing of you're building to the validated threat, and that's what I did at, at the Defense Intelligence Agency, along with also having a science and technical intelligence hat with the Defense Warning Office uh, to look across the, the spectrum at technology, specifically air and space, that are uh, leading edge, uh, things that could, could be disruptive and challenge us. Uh, uh, in, in the future, you know, we're looking 10, 20, and sometimes 50 years out, depending on, on the topic and trying to, to provide the Department of Defense and, and across the intel community a better understanding of some of those potential disruptive threats so that we could uh, get ahead of the game uh, and, and counter them. And when you're at DIA, I, I'm ignorant of this stuff, but you're a Navy guy who then goes to work for DIA. Does that mean you're a Navy guy within DIA or you're always a Navy guy? So when I transitioned to Office of Naval Intelligence, I became civil service. So I'm a Navy employee uh, with the National Intel community. So your service centers, uh, Office of Naval Intelligence, NASIC, National Air and Space Intel Center, the Missile and Space Intel Center is a, a subcomponent of the DIA that's here in, in Huntsville. And uh, then you have the MCIA, which is the Marine Corps Intelligence Activity, and then finally the National Ground Intel Center at Charlottesville. Those are the four what we call service centers, and now you're going to have one for the Space Force co-located at, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Those are uh, service centers that support the analysis that supports the Navy or supports the Marine Corps, supports the Army. But in reality, they are all funded by the, the Director of Na National Intelligence now, the ODNI, as, as National Intel funded uh, billets that uh, are able to support. So, you know, people refer to, to ONI, the Office of Naval Intelligence, as the Navy's Intel Center. The reality is it's the National Maritime Intel Center where we are the threat at the maritime in. And, and when you think of Navy too, right, you gotta remember that Navy is the Navy, but the Navy also has an Air Force, and the Navy has an Army, and the Navy's Army has an Air Force, <laughs> right? So it's a big service. Uh, so 
with that, ONI has a big, big uh, footprint and a, and a big concern. But in all of that, uh, the key in bringing up that the ODNI funds the four service centers is very important because back to the threat that justifies the building of new systems and, and such, right? The Air Force really wants a program. They might go to NASIC and say, we need a threat to drive that program. And we are funded by the national side of the house. So we can say, well, we don't take orders from the Air Force in that regard. We take orders from the Navy so we can you know, this is the assessment, right? That's that's driven out of tradecraft, and and that's the answer. It's kind of independent, you know. It's very independent, and 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 a lot of people don't realize that. You know, they look at those service intel centers as kind of parts of the Air Force, parts of the Army. They are on paper, but in reality, you know, the majority of their budget comes from the national. You you're so you're you have high security clearances. You're you see sensitive stuff, as sensitive as it gets. All through my career. Uh, so, so from there, you know, DIA went back to ONI to, to be the head of air warfare. Really, I was the deputy initially. Uh, then the um, uh, fleeted up, as we say, to be the director of air warfare for ONI. Uh, when I first went back, uh, we had I had everything in, in that air that touches air in the Navy. So, science and technical side, as well as the operational and tactics side, we call it. Uh, Spear uh, is kind of the the nickname for or the the name that that organization uses. Uh, We've got a history all the way back to Desert Storm. Uh, if you watch Top Gun originally, Charlie, that's briefing the MiGs, uh, she, she was based on a spear analyst. So the group that I led has that kind of, of pedigree of, of talking about how capabilities operate. So you know, your national intel uh, centers uh, at NASIC, for example, right, uh, can talk about a Russian fighter. You know, I'll just throw an example. When you, everybody knows we look at Russia. Uh, a Russian fighter and talk about how fast it flies, how, how high it can fly, based on their assessments, right? Uh, what Spear does is we, we get into the head of the pilots and we try to talk about how they're going to fly that aircraft. You know, one of the analogies I've used for years is hockey players, right? Every hockey player has to know how to skate. Some of them are better than the others, but it's really about the game, right? It's, it's about everything else but skating. The skating comes second. So if you think about that and, and apply it to a fighter aircraft, it's how they're, how, they're, how they're deploying that, right? And guys with my background can watch somebody flying an airplane and go, well, he's probably Russian or, you know, or whoever, right? Or might, that's probably an American. <laughs> yeah. So, it, you know, you really kind of can recognize some of the, the, the techniques and, and the way they do things. You know, a mutual friend of ours was trying to describe how high up you went, and he compared you to uh, a two-star admiral. That wasn't accurate, exactly. You, you weren't comfortable with that. But how, how would I explain to our audience how far up the rung you went? Well, sure. It's it's right in as and, and and I didn't want to really push any uh, buttons with that. Uh, so from from O and I, you know, went to the Pentagon and I worked in N two and six, which is the headquarters level for naval intelligence. The director of naval intelligence uh, is is dual hatted, is what we call the N two and six, which is just you know the op nav office code. Um, at that point, I was still a fifteen, uh, and then I went off to be uh, the J two, the director of intelligence for the Joint Warfare Analysis Center at Dahlgren. Uh, and then from there, I was promoted uh, initially to what we call Tier 1, uh, Defense Intelligence Senior Level Tier 1, uh, which is a, as a senior executive position. Uh, and then was uh, within eight months or so, I was bumped up to a Tier 2, which is where the two-star comes in. Uh, you know, it's an equivalency uh, throughout my career. It's been, you know, are you really equal, right? We always throw out GS-15s or colonels or... Yeah, right. There's an equivalency, uh, but you don't go busting around the Pentagon saying, oh, I, I, I'll rank you or, you know, yeah. so. I'm an admiral. Right, right. yeah. But, but you do uh, have the, the gravitas, if that's a good word to use, that's not a good word to use, the, the kind of the, the peer level, uh, right? Uh, so, you know, if I'd go into a meeting uh, with a two star or a one star, you know, kind of have a peer level. So I'm not put in, in the corner, you know, and, and typically in my meetings, I, you know, I was there representing someone higher than me as well. Sometimes I'm representing myself, but sometimes I'm there representing someone higher than me, so then I inherit their authority. I'm sitting at their seat with their name on it, so I'm speaking for that person. I wouldn't be sent to that meeting if I couldn't speak for that person. Uh, and a lot of that in the Pentagon is resource sponsoring. So, you know, I sat in many uh, uh, tables where I was representing the resource sponsor, and that gets attention because acquisition programs at your NAV Air, your NAV C, your Air Force Material Command, those are all built on requirements back to the threat right and and those requirements are paid for by resource sponsors so the resource sponsor says we need a new jammer and and from that resource sponsor requirements are driven and then capabilities are built and they go to whoever can build that capability whether that's nav air or that's nav you know whoever that might be right so uh so in those circles you know you get to know a lot of people 
uh, and that helped me later uh, to, to really kind of know who, who I need to reach out to. Can you describe for me at what point UFOs, they were called then, UAPs now, at what point that kind of got on your radar screen? Was it something you had at least a casual interest in growing up or it came a point in your professional career that it, it landed on your desk? Yeah, every time I've done anything related to UAP or UFO has been my job. Um, and, and what I mean by that, I didn't really have a, a passion growing up. I didn't have all the books. I didn't watch all the TV shows. Um, I stepped into a job uh, at the Defense Intelligence Agency where uh, some things came across the desk, again, thinking technologies and other things where I needed to, to really kind of dig in and understand potentials. And those potentials, uh, you know, I kept an open mind, a skeptic mind, uh, whatever you want to call it, you know, looking for uh, something that could answer this uh, in all the means that I had to, 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 to chase that. Uh, but there were definitely some times where we really couldn't close the loop. And with that, uh, we realized that, that uh, something needed to be done about it. Hey!